Hello, and welcome to Learning the Social Sciences. Today we're going to be going over the reasons for the French Revolution and the initial events before it kind of goes crazy with the reign of terror. Let's jump right into it. So the French Revolution, of course, what comes up is Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI, the monarchs at the time of the revolution. However, if we want to talk about the reasons for the French Revolution, we're going to have to go back to Louis XIV and the Sun King. We could go farther back from there, but let's just keep it simple. So Louis XIV was the absolute of absolutes. He was the person who went and suppressed the power of the nobility, who went and made the extravagance of Versailles, but he's also the guy that built a whole bunch of economic issues for France. He loved to go to war. He, of course, is building Versailles and starting up this very expensive and elaborate court. And so when he dies, after having one of the longest reigns, well, having the longest reign in French history, but one of the longest reigns of European history, he is somebody that left France in a not that great position economically. Now, after him came Louis XV, who also had the Mississippi bubble happen, and that didn't help either. So with the Mississippi bubble is that France just entered a economic recession after the Mississippi colony failed, and a guy by the name of John Law kind of started a little bit of some inflation by printing a whole lot of money so people would invest in the company that in the stocks that he was in charge of, and it all went downhill and ended into recession to keep it simple. Uh, Louis the Fifteenth also invested in the American Revolutionary War so that he could, you know, just kind of go at the Brits, a longtime enemy, and that was also costly. And so when Louis the Sixteenth came in, he came in with a country with a lot of debt, and it wasn't good. Now, Louis the XVI had married an Austrian princess, the daughter of Maria Theresa, uh, Marie Antoinette. Now, she was mocked for not having children right away, even though, yeah, it was Louis's fault for them not having kids. But, you know, it's not like everybody was looking into that. Anyway, Marie Antoinette kind of had some problems. So court life at Versailles is not always the most exciting. You go through these routines each and every day over and over and over again. And yes, you are super wealthy. And yes, you can eat strawberries um, and you can live the grand life. But you're also just kind of like if you're a female walking around watching guys play cards um, or going, you know, to possibly something new like a concert inside Versailles, um, or you're just chit-chatting and doing other things. Um, so during her time, um, Marie Antoinette kind of picked up this gambling obsession and a shopping obsession and just an obsession with spending money. Now that is not good if your country is kind of teetering economically. Um, <clears throat> so Marie kind of gets a lot thrown at her simply because of who she was as an Austrian, another enemy of France, but also because of her habits with gambling and shopping and, you know, just elaborate hairdos. <clears throat> now, of course, nothing summarizes best Marie's kind of vantage point of the world is her pe peasant's cottage. I mean, if this is the life of a peasant, please sign me up. I mean, if I could live there in that house, I would love it, you know? Sign me up. But no, this is her peasant's life. This is when she goes out from Versailles. Um, so there is an obvious distach for what's going on with the country. Now, like I said, France is on uh, teetering towards a financial crisis under the reign of Louis the Sixteenth. France was in debt due to the Seven Years' War and due to the American Revolution. Um, and Louis the Sixteenth knows that there's a problem and he's looking for a way to fix it. However, he's not really the best guy to just kind of go and make, you know, these plans that calls for, you know, some anger from like the nobility. He's not the guy that wants to go and do that. Um, Louis the Sixteenth really just wants to be a locksmith. That's all he wants to do. He wants to fix that problem. He wants to say, how can I pick this lock? And he wants to go and do that. Um, so, yeah, that's his vantage point on it. Not necessarily saying, hey, nobles, 
you now got to pay some taxes. You haven't ever paid some taxes, but now looking at the books, it's time for you to pay some taxes. Um, and also, there's no really way for him to go and even have other branches to go and help him push this through, like what you would have in Great Britain. The Parliament would meet and probably push through some sort of taxes on the nobility once they realize that the time is kind of coming for that. Now, the Estates General, um, which was the legislative branch of France, had not met since Louis XIV because he didn't want it to ever meet, and so they didn't. So all you really have in France are these French royal courts, these small bodies called parlements with an E, um, not an IA like a British parliament, but with an E, um, that is now going and giving suggestions or just basically saying no to any idea that might actually solve the crisis. So who are the people trying to solve it? Well, we've got Jacques Nakia, uh, the Royal Director General of Finances. He looked at the books and he just said, okay, if the first and second estate, the nobility and the church would pay taxes, France would be totally fine, 100% fine, no financial crisis. However, the first and second estate don't wanna pay taxes. Um, in fact, actually, the second estate, the nobility, they kind of actually just got a check every year for simply having a title. Um, so th these are people that don't want to pay taxes. They also don't want to lose their free money that's coming in every year simply because they're a sir. They don't want to give that up. So eventually Jacques Necker leaves his position and we have two other people come in, Brion and Cologne, um, and both of them go and also say, hey, if maybe the church paid back its debts, we would be fine. The church says no to that. We have the idea of, hey, maybe if we institute a property tax, that's a way to secretly tax the first and second estate. And of course, no, 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 no. And eventually Jacques Necker comes right back into the mix to be the guy in charge of the finances. But he is one that the third estate, the everybody else category, um, they really love him because he at least is saying the first and second estate need to be taxed somehow, some way. And so they see him as the guy on the inside. Now, again, to re-estate re who the three estates are, the first estate is the clergy, the second estate is the nobility, and the third estate is simply everybody else, um, especially this middle class that has, you know, a very high level of intellect. We've got lawyers in there. We've got businessmen um, who want to see some change happen and who would be totally fine with the first and second estate to be taxed. So now we're going to jump through um, some Crane, uh, Crane Brinton's Anatomy of a Revolution because right now we're in the very beginning stages of what seems to be a possible illness here for France. So he borrowed the terms from pathology and basically compared the revolution to a fever or to a disease. And he kind of went through all of the steps of the fever that France is going to go through and the symptoms that they are going to walk through all the way going through the crisis stage or the delirium phase um, that France will eventually jump into. However, he does at the end talk about the very end, how we can, of course, get better, but we could always relapse. So keep that as an option. So jumping back to the economic woes, look at how much money is being spent on bread. France also during this time period now, um, 1787, 1789 is entering a famine. The wheat harvests are failing. And with this, we are going to be entering an even more dangerous um, situation for especially the urban poor, the people that rely on going to the store and buying bread. Now they can't afford to go to the store and buy bread. So we're having major issues. If you are spending 80% of your income on bread, how are you paying for your apartment? How are you paying for clothing? How are you paying for any other cost of life if 80% of your income is for food? It doesn't work. So, of course, complaints are being made. People are saying that the king is two-faced. People are talking about the deficit and who's taking the money. Of course, it's the clergy and the first estate. They're pilfering the boxes. Some things have to change. Hey, King Louis, you got to change some things. So what does Louis do? He calls the Estates General back to session after being out for a long, long time. And yeah, 
other issues now come to pass. So if we call back the estates general, how is voting going to work out? Is it that the first, second, and third estate each get like the same number of rep represent representatives? Does the first estate get 300, the second estate get 300, and the third estate get 300? Well, if that's the case, then the first and second estate are going to definitely outvote the third estate and no change is going to be happening. And it's going to be just like the rotating door of the finance minister that we are going to go through another round of Nicaras, Briands, and Colognes, and nothing is going to happen here. Now, that's one option. Um, of course, the third estate is thinking, we're not going for that, and they are going to send enough delegates that they can have more people than the first and second estate. Well, then, do we have the issue where the first estate technically altogether only gets one vote, Second estate gets one vote and third estate gets one vote. So only three votes are cast in total and they represent the majority from the people from the first, the second, and the third. Well, that's not also going to lead to a lot of change. So we have voting issues, but the third estate has at least sent in 648 representatives to try to outvote the 300 representatives from each house of the first and second estate. But Louis the 16th is not making a ruling as to how the actual voting will proceed. And so no voting's happening. No change is happening. They don't know what to do when they convene in May of 1789 in Versailles. They don't know what to do. So if you don't know what to do, what are you going to do? Well, I know what can happen if a whole bunch of people get together for a job and they can't do a job. They're probably going to complain. And that's exactly what they are going to do. They are going to start laying out a list of complaints. The Cahiers de Doliences, these are the lists of grievances brought to Versailles by local electors and presented to the king. Governmental waste, indirect taxes, church taxes, corruption, 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 and more corruption. Um, they then also do talk about some things that they want to see changed that can be positives, like more equitable taxes, measures to help facilitate trade and commerce, and of course, a free press. They want a free press. Um, so all of these are coming out. And now this is a bigger problem for Louis because now some of these things are really directed right at him. And he's got to go and deal with this issue. And so what does he do when dealing with this issue? Well, he takes out one of those locks from him wanting to be a locksmith and he locks the door to the delegates for the room for the Estates General. Well, that was an idea. They're not going to complain about you anymore. Oh, wait, no, they're just going to move next to a handball court, which they call the tennis court, um, and they're going to make a new assembly, and they're actually going to call it the National Assembly, and then they're going to take the oath of the tennis court, and they're going to say, we are going to work together as a National Assembly until we have a brand new constitution. Uh-oh, Louis, what did you just do? So they officially declared the National Assembly on June 17, 1789, and that they are going to go and write a new constitution for France. And with it, they are going to make economic reforms. And so with that, they actually went and changed their name right away uh, from the National Assembly to now focusing on the constitution. And so just note, students of history, if you notice that the National Assembly changes its name a few times, yeah, it does. It's going to keep doing it. Anyway, after the um, tennis court oath, Louis the 16th, cap 16th capitulates and orders all representatives from the first and second estate to meet then with the General Assembly. Now, thinking about France on the eve of the revolution, of course, it has its normal enemies. The Austrian Empire and Great Britain are probably the two biggest enemies that they have. Um, we've got what is kind of still the Holy Roman Empire, even though it doesn't really exist, still there in the center. We've got the rising Prussian powerhouse. Um, we've still got Spain to the south, and Italy is also still cut on up into various pieces. Um, <clears throat> now, that is what Europe looks like, but inside of France, we have more issues. The winter and spring of 1788 and 1789 was a time of suffering for many as high bread prices caused shortages and famine and people are now out on the streets just trying to find something to eat. And then the big event happens. 
Um, Louis goes and puts the army outside of Paris because Paris is obviously this hotbed place that is just boiling and boiling and boiling. It seems like it's going to boil over out of the pot. Um, and then Louis goes and dismisses Jacques Necker, the guy on the inside, their friend on July 11th, 1789. And so on July 14th, 1789, large crowds gather. They're angry and they're also fearing Louis. And so they say, hey, we need to form militias to protect ourselves. We saw what happened in the Americas. They had militias. They protected themselves from the British. And look at it. Now they're free from their king. Oops. Oopsie there, monarchy of France. Um, anyway, so they say, hey, we've Got to get as many arms as we can. Where are we going to go? We're going to go to the Bastille, the place, the fortress in the center of Paris, this place that represents the tyranny of the monarchy. It is a fortress. It's also a president. It's where so many people have been held and tortured throughout the um, centuries of the French monarchy. And so they are looking to this place also because it's an arsenal. They've got weapons there and they've got gunpowder and they've got cannons and so they go to the bastille to take it over 98 parisians are going to die in the fight there um and eventually they are going to take the governor drag him through the streets kind of beating him and stabbing him along the way until he asks to die and they kindly oblige and they kill him and then they cut off his head and put it on a pike and parade it throughout the streets of paris now, this is the time where the government should say, all right, all right, all right, all right. Can we stop? Can we stop this violence? You guys are scared. Let's talk about it. Let's maybe move our troops back from Paris. Because now you guys are definitely boiling over. You have just killed the governor of the Bastille and also had 98 fellow comrades of yourself die in the process. Um, now, the National Guard is being led by this guy who, if you know your U.S. history, Marquet de Marquet, Marquis de Lafayette um, officially takes over the Bastille and they start to take it down piece by piece by piece. But eventually Lafayette is actually going to leave France and head on over with that key to the Bastille back to the Americas and give it to George Washington. So he's not going to be there the whole time in charge of things. Um, but the people of Paris do have now weapons, but they don't have this voice telling them to stop. Stop with the violence. Stop. We can't do that. So the storming of the Bastille, July 14, 1789, is a huge moment in French history. And they still, still celebrate Bastille Day every single year this year because it is like their July 4th. Um, it is like their independence, but it's a different kind of independence because um, for them, it's their independence from the old regime everything that had been happening prior and now they are taking up their own destiny into their own hands and we'll see where it leads them all right so thank you for tuning in to the first part of the french revolution if you have any questions definitely ask them in the comments below and yeah if you like this like and subscribe thank you very much